Coral, the partner of Marlin and Nemo's mother, is taken away too early from her family's lives. But in the briefest of moments, we see her presented to us with wonderful Pixar storytelling, which is able to bring us to connect with, learn about, and care for this clownfish. And today, I'm going to go through it all to explain everything we know about her and how she made an impact in her family's life. Hello, I'm Isaac from Watso Videos, where we discuss fun topics for fun people. On my channel, I focus on spreading magic by examining Disney films, so if you are new here, consider subscribing. But today, I'm actually not alone. I'm making today's video as a part of the Pixar Perception Project, led by the YouTube channel Network 1901. To celebrate the release of Toy Story 4 and appreciate the wonderful moments Pixar is able to create in their films, myself and a variety of other channels are discussing Pixar today, placing all of our videos into one Pixar Perception playlist, which you can find a link to in the description. But just to let you know, this isn't an exclusive playlist. If you would like to make a video discussing a moment in a Pixar film that you love and want it added to the playlist, then use the hashtag Pixar Perception on Twitter and tag Network1901 and they'll make sure you're added. While there are so many fantastic and emotional moments in Pixar, like Woody saying goodbye to Andy, Mama Coco singing Remember Me, Sully and Boo reuniting, and of course Carl and Ellie's love story, the life and death of Coral is definitely one experience that I will never forget. And it all began when we see Coral and Marlin looking out into the ocean from their new anemone. While Marlin is admiring his job well done, securing his home, all he can do is continue to say wow until Coral finally fully acknowledges what she's seeing for him. But Marlin isn't through showing off the view as he is proud of his accomplishment. Did your man deliver or did he deliver? My man delivered. Their banter shows us right away that there's a level of comfort and history between these two clownfish. They are able to speak freely with one another and are open to sharing what they both desire in their lives as they have expressed they are a couple. Coral is patient with Marlin when he's excited even when she practically knows what he's going to say. It wasn't so easy. Because a lot of other clownfish had their eyes on this place. You better believe they did. Every single one of them. We later learned that these two met some time ago when Marlin began talking to her by asking for her to check out if he had a hook in his mouth and likely went in for the kiss after that. From this initial moment together, they stuck by one another's side, learned each other's quirks and habits, and began to bring the lives they hoped to create into the world. They chose each other as partners, and then eventually, after some time of being together, they got the home of their dreams. In a Finding Nemo deleted scene, which existed when the moments with Coral would occur throughout the film instead of all at the beginning, we actually got to witness Coral seeing the anemone for the first time, and she was enthralled by what Marlin had gotten for them. She could hardly believe it. By establishing Coral desire to have a view on her home and knowing where they live is a highly competitive place, we see that Marlin has a deep commitment to Coral and strives to make her happy. And Coral is absolutely grateful. Mm-hmm. You did good. And the neighborhood is awesome. Although she says she's excited to be where they are in the ocean, Coral visibly remains unsure. And because of that, a bit of Marlin's insecurities begin to come forward. So you do like it, don't you? No, no, no. I do, I do, I do. I really do like it. Coral acknowledges the drop-off is ideal for the great schools and the view, but she is unsure of the level of extravagance Marlin went into for her. She's a humble girl just making sure they have what they need without losing sight of what's important. In her opinion, the whole place just seems like it could be too much space, but Marlin doesn't feel that way at all. Coral, honey, these are our kids we're talking about. They deserve the best. Marlin's passion for their home is clear as he swims around and goes through a scenario of their kids seeing the beauty of the ocean by seeing a whale right outside of their bedrooms. But while Coral finds his antics hilarious and cute, she is the first to remember their kids are right below them. Shh, you're gonna wake the kids. Oh, right, right. Both parents do love their children and keep them in their minds and hearts, but Coral is the one who is fins on right from the start. She's ready to watch over them and is taken aback whenever she sees them. In another deleted scene in Finding Nemo, we were able to see Coral as she was pregnant with her eggs. The couple was both nervous and excited, but Coral was able to remain calm, assert herself, and strongly carry their family. I could watch them all. 
When the two see their children sometime after she lays them, Coral reminds Marlin they still have to name them before they hatch. With that reminder, Marlin is ready to make a decisive decision naming half of the offspring Marlin Jr. and the other half Coral Jr. We have seen Marlin's commitment to having a family and being a provider, but Marlin is treating the birth of his children as a milestone to rush through and acts with more haste than that of Coral. Coral, on the other hand, is seen to be putting a great deal of thought and care into her children already. She's imagining her children already as more individuals than a large group to take care of. The name she'd love to give her child is a little more nuanced and unique compared to Marlin's. I like Nemo. Nemo? Well, we'll name one Nemo, but I'd like most of them to be Marlin Jr. Regardless of how each clownfish is thinking about their kids, though, they're just ecstatic to be parents. But the thoughts of being a parent brings out Merlin's insecurities again. Of course, Merlin has a good chance of being liked by his children, so Coral wants him to know that. What if they don't like me? Merlin. Oh, really? There's over 400 eggs. Odds are one of them is bound to like you. Coral attempts to delegitimize Merlin's concerns, partaking in the gracious act of handling someone's worries, something I can definitely relate to myself. Let me know if you need that type of support too in the comments by commenting a fish emoji. The kind words by Coral leads to Marlin remembering why he fell so deeply for her and brings him to gaze at her with longing eyes. What? You remember how we met? Well, I try not to. Marlin then playfully recounts the moment they met as he flirtatiously goes after Coral while she laughs as she swims away from his advances. These two have a lot of energy between them, and they are able to use that excitement for one another to have fun, handle topics of life, and keep their days light and joyful as they show their affection for one another. That moment they recounted brought them farther in their lives together, which culminated into them choosing one another and becoming parents. Love was definitely felt between them. Unfortunately though, after their relationship is established and we are able to track back what happened to them all the way to the beginning of their time together, their lives as a couple within the ocean would soon be no more. Coral dashes out of the anemone to avoid Marlin, but when she exits, Coral gazes upon a predatory and massive barracuda, staring down her and her family. When Marlin sees the threat, Marlin's first instinct is to keep Coral safe. Coral, get inside the house, Coral. But when Coral looks down and sees her children below her, we see she feels she cannot abandon them. Protecting the eggs she and Marlin created are part of her life. We can see she is deciding how to protect. No, Coral, don't. They'll be fine. Just get inside you right now. In an original concept of the scene, only Marlin acted to save the eggs as the Barracuda feasted upon them in a horrifying display where you could even hear the children screaming. The Barracuda only relented when it had gotten its fill and attacked Coral. But Nemo's true mother wasn't passive. She took action. Against her husband's wishes, in an attempt to keep her family safe, she dashes down, aware of the danger she's in, leading to the Barracuda to react and swim after her and the eggs. Marlin screams and goes after the Barracuda to assist his wife, but the beast knocks him out inside his home, which protects him as the world goes dark. After Marlin is knocked unconscious, the Barracuda kills and consumes Coral and all of her children, except one. Coral sacrificed herself for her children, and in the end, she was able to assist in the saving of one of them. When Marlin awakens, we see him discover the horrors that have taken place, as he sees the empty area that used to hold his eggs, as he desperately calls for his wife, Coral. even though Marlin would not be seeing Coral ever again. Coral. In that moment, after discovering the fate of his children and the death of his wife, he's all alone until he discovers his wife will live on. Through his tears, Marlin finds the sole survivor of his family lying beneath him, who his wife sacrificed her life to keep alive. In that moment, Marlin commits himself to his child, declaring he will do whatever it takes to protect him like his wife had already done for him. He would engage in his son's life as much as he could and ensure Coral's life was not taken for nothing. To commemorate his wife and to allow her memory to live on in her son, he gives his only son the name Coral loved. And Marlin tells his son his name when he makes a lifelong promise. I promise I will never let anything happen to you. Nemo. Coral and Marlin are introduced, are set up to have a loving relationship, and are separated forever in the span of less than five minutes in real time. There's no montage, we're just seeing them together. 
Everything we know about Nemo's mother lies within this time frame, and a few deleted scenes. But even though it's short, we are able to learn so much about her, which is likely why I feel like I remember her so well. I think it's kind of amazing that a character like Coral has been able to resonate with me for years even though she was barely even in the film. I think the reason Coral feels so real and memorable is because each moment, line, and action characterizes these clownfish. Every second is used to show us who they are, how they work together, and what they want. With all of that information Pixar presents to us, I find Coral becomes a dynamic character. Coral was a strong clownfish who was willing to voice her thoughts, share her love, and protect those she cared for. She was a humble person who consistently thought beyond herself and acted often in a thoughtful, fun, and engaging way. When times got tough or trials came across her, she was relentless in her actions, which meant that when her family was threatened, she did everything in her power to protect them. Even though she perished too early in her life though, her memory, motivations, and morals lived on in Marlin and Nemo through Marlin's promise. But now it's time to hear your thoughts. What are your favorite Pixar moments? Or who is your favorite character who is only in a film for a very short period of time? Let me know what you think in the comments along with any other ideas you have for future videos. To see more Pixar videos like this one, you can find a link to those videos in the description along with the Pixar Perception playlist. And if you'd like to continue to see more magical discussions like this one, then don't forget to click that subscribe button and the beautiful bell if you're new. Thank you to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon who are amazing supporters of my videos. And as always, thanks for watching and have a magical day.